kids sing like that in church. I think, man, there's all kinds of garbage kids are singing these days. I really appreciate hearing kids sing about Jesus Christ. All right, go in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, and if you, if you can, uh, stand with me for just a moment as we read a verse here, Hebrews chapter number 4. And I really believe in all of my heart that the most important, uh, most important book in the entire world is the Bible. Maybe the greatest school you can go to is Sunday school, right? Because that's where you learn the book. So Hebrews chapter number 4, Hebrews chapter number 4, I'm just going to read one verse out of Hebrews chapter 4, and I'm going to be focusing on verse number 12, and I want to talk to you this morning about what a relationship with the Bible can give you. Uh, I would say most Christians today sort of see the Bible as something that you pull out on Sunday, maybe. Uh, and maybe Wednesday if you make it to church. Uh, but uh, th- I'll tell you right now, you need it every single day of your life. Uh, the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 12. For the word of God is quick, that means it's alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Brother Jose, would you ask the Lord to bless the message? Amen. Be seated if you would. Let me, let me open up by saying this. You are currently in a Bible-believing church. Amen. I don't say that to beat our chest or say that we're special, but I'll just say this. We believe every single word. I believe every single word in this book. Amen. From in the beginning to even so, come Lord Jesus, amen. amen. And everything in between. I believe every word. I believe the words in italics are there for a reason. Guys, I believe every word of God is pure. You are in a Bible-believing church, but I'll tell you right now, it's not enough just to say, man, we believe every word. You've got to go beyond that. That is a great starting point. But believing everything that God said and not knowing what he said to you doesn't really help you a whole lot. And I'm going to tell you what you need more than anything else in your life is a relationship with this book. Some of you might think that sounds a little strange. How can I have a relationship with a book? It's, it's, not a, it's just a book. It's an inanimate object. On the contrary, it says that it is alive. It is quick and powerful. That means it's alive and well. It can do something. Guys, have you ever, uh, those that have read through their Bibles at all, have you ever read somewhere and go, man, that wasn't there a second ago? Right? right? You read through your Bible a month later, you go, oh, I was just reading this passage again. Whoa, look at that. That wasn't there. It was there the whole time, but it's alive, and it comes to you in a certain way, and it does something inside of you as a believer. You cannot have victory over sin without this book. You can't enjoy the Christian life without this book. Listen, guys, the idea of standing out in a corner and telling people about Jesus Christ sounds like you're some kind of crazy Yahoo fanatic until you get in this Bible and read it for yourself and find out that's where Jesus preached, that's where the disciples preached, that's where the first century Christians preached. What am I getting at? This book changes you. It's supposed to change you. Listen, we we understand that according to this passage of Scripture, the Word of God is powerful. Can I say this? Not only is it powerful, it's piercing. It goes into places where nothing else and nobody else can go. This book is different than any other book. Guys, can I say it like this? If this book was just written by men, you're wasting your time this morning, really. If I believe this book was just written by men, there's no cotton-picking way. I'd be here right now. I'd be in Breckenridge still up there with my wife. Amen. I'm telling you right now, guys, if this book is just written by men, this book is different because it is inspired by God. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, the Bible says that God took man from the dust of the ground. You really believe that God created? Yeah, what do you believe? Well, I believe that billions of years ago there was a spark out there, and I would ask you, where did the spark come from? Well, where was the energy behind that spark? Where did all that come from? In the beginning, God. 
created the heaven and the earth. I believe that God formed man from the dust of the ground and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. You know what this is, guys? This is just ink and paper unless it's breathed on by God. When the Bible says the word of God is quick, you go, well, that's old English. I can't understand that. Come on, guys. Anybody ever gone to the doctor and they say, well, you cut yourself down to the quick of your nail. That's the part of your nail that's alive. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper, piercing, than any two-edged sword. You know what else it is? It's perceiving. This book knows your thoughts. When you come to this book and you start reading it, you go, man, Lord, why are you telling me that? Why is that coming out? Man, I can't. You say, why? Because it's not just like any other book. When you open up this book, it's almost like God knows what's going on inside of your heart and head because he does. You see, this book is supposed to, the way it's intended by God is it is called a mirror. It's called a looking glass over in the book of James. And as you read it, not only does it tell you about God, not only does it transport you beyond where you're at, up into the third heaven and show you who God is, but it shows you who you are. You will never be the person that God intended you to be without knowing this book. And and we've been told, we've been told, we've seen it over and over and over. The Bible says you're supposed to read this book. You're supposed to study this book. You're supposed to memorize this book. My question this morning is, how much of this book is in your life? How much are you in this book and how much of this book is in you? I'm going to tell you right now, guys, without this book, we've got nothing. I can't say, keep talking about this book, this book. Guys, without this book, we've got nothing. You talk about Jesus Christ and the gospel, you don't got that without this book. You talk about the the second coming of Jesus, you don't have that without the Bible. You don't have any confidence in what you believe without the book that's here in your lands. What am I saying? This book is very different. And I'm telling you right now, you need to have a relationship with this book. Now look, I understand that this book is not God. I get that. But without this book, you don't know him. There's no parallel between you and God. Guys, there's no connection. You go, well, I can go out in nature and I can, you know, I can just know God, you know, throw my line out there on, you know, uh, Blue Mesa out there in Gunnison and just me and God out there. Guys, here's what you learn by looking at nature. Romans, and by the way, the only reason I can say this emphatically is because I know what Romans 1, which is in that book, has to say. In Romans chapter 1, it says you can see from the, 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 the visible things, from the things that are created, you can see the invisible things of God. You can look, anyone with a rational, common sense logic in, in, upstairs goes out. You don't, listen, by the way, nobody believes in anything outside of this unless they're educated into believing it. Right. You go out into nature and go, someone did this, someone made this, this came from somebody, somebody designed this, somebody put it here, and that's about as far as you can get with general revelation. To get specific revelation from God and to go beyond the fact that there's a God and he made all this, to go beyond that, you've got to have a book. And I'm telling you, without getting into this book, you will never understand what God desires and God has designed for your life as a believer. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, maybe you've been a religious person, maybe you believe in a lot of good stuff, but you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'm going to tell you, the only way to get saved is by hearing a message that comes from this book. Listen, you may say God's not the Bible, why is not God, but let me just give you some things that parallel between them. God is alive. Can I get an amen on that? He's alive and well. You know what this book is? It's alive. You know what God is? He is immutable. That's a big fancy way of saying, you know, He never changes. And you know what? Outside of man trying to corrupt the Word of God, this book doesn't change. It's eternally the way that God has put it. Can I say this? God sees your thoughts. You know the eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good? Do you know that? You know what happens when you tell young people they came from monkeys and there's no God? They start acting like it. (laughs) Amen! (laughs) Amen! You know, oh, God, what are we going to do? If they see the Ten Commandments, that might hurt their self-esteem. Good! Good! You know what they need? They need to be told, you're a punk unless you get right with God. Amen. I mean, seriously, guys. I mean, 50 years ago, come on, guys. 50 years ago, when people just automatically knew, you shouldn't lie. Today, it's like, well, you know, maybe under the circumstances, if... No, no, thou shall not bear false witness. Right? What, what, what am I getting at? Guys, the, the Bible elevated our society. 
And when the Bible was pushed out, we are seeing the devolution of our society happening in our, before our very eyes. Guys, if you understood some of the things that kids these days are looking at and seeing and laughing about, why did that happen? Because we threw the Bible out of school, we threw the Bible out of government, and can I say this? We threw the Bible out of the home and out of the church as well. Without this, I'm telling you, it all goes to pot. The guy that taught me the Bible said this, well, go back to the Bible, go back to the jungle, and it's the truth. Listen, God sees your thoughts. The Bible sees your thoughts. You know what Jesus Christ is called in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Now, I'm not saying this book is God, but boy, they're real close. Jesus is called the Word. This book is called the Word of God. Jesus says, I'm the bread from heaven. You know what the Bible says about itself? It's God's manna dropped down for you. Yeah. Boy, they're close. You're not going to know God without this book. That's right. And I'll tell you right now, when you get into trouble as a Christian, it's because that book is sitting on a shelf. Right. When you get into trouble as, as, as a believer, it's because you have skipped, and you go, you know what? I, I need it. I'll get to it later. I'll deal with it later. Uh, uh, yet, Lord, I understand it should be central. We say this all the time. The Bible is my final authority in all matters of faith and practice until it says something that I don't like. Until it tells me not to date that person, not to go here, not to listen to that, not to watch that, not to make that decision. Until then, it's my final authority. I'm telling you, it should be your final authority beyond that. I'm not saying it's always easy, but it's right. And you need a relationship with this book. Can I say this? There ought to be coffee stains in your Bible. If you drink coffee. And if you don't, get right with God and start drinking coffee. Hey, can I say this? There ought to be some tear stains in this book. There might be some places where you just got alone with God and you cried. And you flip through there and you go, man, the pages are a little lengthy from the tears. Look, I'm, I'm not, I, I see the value in having a Bible on your phone. It's convenient. It's portable. I get all that. And if you brought one today, I'm not bashing you, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like holding this in your hands. There's no sound like. When I say turn your Bibles and I hear that's a glorious sound. One of the greatest sounds this side of heaven, I believe. What am I saying? Guys, you need a relationship with this book right here. There ought to be some highlights in your Bible. There ought to be some question marks. What did he mean there? <laughs> you ever read your Bible and go, what in the world is all that about? You know, I'll never forget. I, this is just, I don't know why. This is, I love this story. All the guys are camping a couple years ago. And Brother Elvin's going through his Bible for the first time. Brother, you've read it through now, haven't you? That's a blessing. Man, he used, to, he used to tell me, man, I never learned anything about the Bible. I grew up in church and, you know, in a, in a church I went to, I never even opened a Bible. And now I'm reading the whole thing. And we're sitting there, I'm all excited. He goes, and I'm reading in my Bible. What's this word, concub, concubine, concubine? I said, well, we'll answer that some other day, brother. We'll <laughs> give that some other time. <laughs> But yeah, there's be some question marks in your Bible. Like, what is that, right? I mean, if you're reading your Bible, can I say this as well? Uh, you may come across certain words, you go, I don't understand that. That's a different kind of language. Elevate your language. Yeah. Don't de-elevate the Bible. All right? It's, it's better to go, look, I don't know what anon, A-N-O-N means. But if I connect this passage over here in Matthew with the passage over there in Luke, I realize that anon means immediately. So guess what? I just learned a new word instead of changing the Bible. Right. I got smarter, amen. amen. What, what am I saying? What I'm saying is this, guys. There needs to be a real relationship with this book. There ought to be some places where you go, God, I prayed over this, and your word said you supply all my need, and I didn't think I could give to missions, but I did it anyways. And Lord, I'm highlighting Philippians where it says, My God shall supply all my need through his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Man, there ought to be some places that are personal to you in this book. Why? Because you ought to have a relationship with it. Why? Because it's what shows you who God is, and it shows you who you are. I love reading through my notes. I, I, I found my Bible. I'll never forget. My dad helped me get my first Bible that I got after I was called to preach. And I remember going to Bolivia, South America, uh, with a group of young people from our church. My wife was in that group. And uh, that's sort of where she caught my eye a little bit, by the way. Um, but I remember we went to Bolivia, and they made this, uh, this guy there was a, a leather craftsman, and he made a, 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 a beautiful leather cover Bible. And I told him, here's what I want on it. And he's, 
He's, you know, from, from South America. He had no idea what it meant. And I, it's all in English, you know. And, and so he did it, and it's beautiful. And I love opening that Bible. And every once in a while, I'll just do it just for fun. I'll open that Bible, I'll go through. And I'll look at some of the notes I wrote as a teenager. I'm like, that was off. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll go through and go, boy, Adrian, what were you thinking? That was nowhere near what the Bible was saying there. <laughs> but it's still precious to me. Amen. And, and to see just over time, from 14 years old on, seeing the notes in my Bible and seeing uh, all the places. I'll never forget one time we were missionaries on deputation. We were in Tennessee, and, and I had a weird habit. I used to put everything on the hood of our car, on the top when we were getting our, our kids in, you know, and, 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 and I'd put everything on top of the car. Matter of fact, one time in Tennessee, I'll never forget, I-65. Anybody familiar with Nashville? Anybody know anything about Nashville? Or I-65, there was an on-ramp right around... Uh, Oh, what is that uh, by the, the mall there in Goodlettsville, whatever that, uh, Rivergate Mall. And I'm coming off that, that, that uh, uh, on-ramp, and all of a sudden I look in my rearview mirror, and I just see a bunch of paper flying everywhere. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's weird, and I kept driving, my wallet! <laughs> I put my wallet on top of the car. Oh, man, I just had this really bad habit, and one time we were on, uh, on deputation and visiting this church, and I put my wife's Bible on top of our car, and I drove off, and Somewhere between there and the time that the preacher said, open your Bibles, and she didn't have one to open, I realized. <laughs> and like all of a sudden, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So the next day, I go out there. People thought I was insane. I'm looking and, you know, I'm, I'm just walking. I keep walking, you know, over and over and over in this certain section. Why? Because that book meant something to her. Not too long ago, we had a, vis a missionary visiting through here, maybe, I guess, about two years ago or so, and, and uh, his dad actually put a great commentary Bible together, and, and, uh, and he said, Preacher, I'd like, do you have this Bible? I said, No, I'd love to have it. And, and I was all excited, and then my wife was like, Well, you know, I don't have a new Bible, and I'd like to have a nice commentary. So I'm like, Okay, all right. And to this day, every once in a while, we'll be reading our Bibles together in the morning. She goes, You know, this commentary Bible is awesome. It says this. I'm like, I know. It should have been mine. <laughs> you say, what is it? The Bible should be precious to you. Amen. Charles Spurgeon said, nobody ever outgrows the scriptures. That's right. The book widens and deepens with our years. A.W. Right. Tozer, who wrote some great books on prayer, said the word of God, well understood and religiously obeyed, is the shortest route to spiritual perfection. And we must not select a few favorite passages to the exclusion of others. Here's one. Talk to anybody about the gospel. Well, I think you're judging me. The Bible says judge not. They don't know anything else in the Bible but that word. <laughs> judge not. I'm like, well, it also says to judge righteous judgment. By the way, I'm not judging you, so on and so forth. But the point is this. You can't just isolate the stuff that you like at the exclusion of the stuff that you don't. Right. It's all or nothing. Nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. 16th President of the United States said, I am profitably engaged in reading the Bible. Take all this book that you can. Balanced by faith, you'll never live and die a better man. It is the best book which God has given to man. One of your presidents said that. So great is my veneration for the Bible that the earlier my children begin to read it, the more confident will be my hopes that they will prove useful citizens to their country and respectable members of society. John Quincy Adams. Another one of your presidents said that. Well, we've come a long way, haven't we? I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. How to land safe on that happy shore? God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end, he came from heaven. He's written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me that book. I have it. Here it is. Knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book, John Wesley. Soren Kierkegaard said, The Bible is very easy to understand, but we Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. Amen. Now, come on, that's funny. That's true, though. You know, it's like, hey, man, I, I ran out of gas. Brother, come into church. I'll pray for you. That's Christian for I'm not going to help you. <laughs> right? We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well the minute we understand, we're obliged to act accordingly. In 6 BC, six years before Christ, there was a plague in Athens that was destroying the entire city. And so what they had done, and the only thing that they knew, we understand from reading Romans chapter 1 that at one time, 
the entire Gentile world knew God, but the Gentile world became unthankful. When they had a knowledge of God, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And they said, you know what? We're going we're to put God over here and we're going to follow our own gods of our own making. And the Bible says that because of that, God turned them over to a reprobate mind. And in 6 BC, what did they do? They got away from the book. And in 6 BC, there's a plague that sweeps through the entire city of Athens. And people are dying by the scores. And they're sacrificing to the God of fertility. And they're offering sacrifices to, to every god that they know. The god of thunder and the god of this and, and the god of that and the god of disease and the god of health. And they're doing all these sacrifices. And finally they go, guys, we, there's, there's some god that we're missing. And they call for a priest from Cyprus. And this man comes and he explains to them, there's a god that you don't know. He said, what kind of God would this be? He must be a gracious God and a God of kindness if he's going to help you in your affliction. And they said, God, if there's a God of graciousness and a God of kindness and a God that will help us in our affliction, we will offer a sacrifice to the unknown God. And amazingly, some 40 or so years later, a man named the Apostle Paul goes through that very city and sees an inscription on an altar that says to the unknown God. And you know what he does? He begins to expound to them from the scriptures who that unknown God is. I'm telling you, without this, you don't know who God is. There's a great book by a guy named Don Richardson called Eternity in Their Hearts. Anybody ever heard of it? Great book. He writes Lords of the Earth. He writes Peace Child. And in this book, Eternity in Their Hearts, what he does is he chronicles several, I mean scores, I'm talking several tribes throughout uh, history, going back to, to uh, before Christ to modern day. And, and, and in some of these tribes, one particular tribe in southeastern Asia, they had been waiting. They had been waiting for generations for a man to come with a book from heaven. You say, why? Somebody had told them, listen, whatever gods you're worshiping, those aren't the right gods. There's a God that wants to know you, and for you to know him, you've got to know him through a book that he's going to provide for you. And they waited and waited and waited, and one day a missionary came with the Bible. Amen. And they said, that's the right God. You say, why? Because God is a God that's found in a book. What kind of relationship do you have with the Bible this morning? What can the Bible give me? I don't know. By, by human nature, I think sometimes we're selfish. Let's be honest. You know, Most of us have a, what I would call a Paula Abdul mentality. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> for those of you that were born in, you know, after 1990, you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. It's all right. But, but here's it. My wife just shakes her head. Why would you ever mention Paula Abdul from the pulpit? The way we are wired is we're wired to think of what's in it for me. Am I right about that? Let's be honest. Oftentimes we help people because we can get something out of helping them. If I help you, if I scratch your back, you scratch mine, right? I mean, I'm just going to confess something to you. There are times where Ariana will go, Daddy, can you get me some, you know, Reese's Pieces or something like that? And, you know, there's a, there's a dairy limit within the Dominguez household. And when you cross the dairy threshold that mom has said, you're crossing in a dangerous territory. And so, you know, it's oftentimes like this. I'll get you the Reese's Pieces if you can just sort of get this spot on my back. And she's got, she's got great hands, you know. You say, what is it? I'll give you if you give me. Isn't that how we are? So oftentimes, you know what the Lord has to do to get us to do right? Hey, let me show you what I give you if you'll get into this book. Can I say this first off? He'll give you a conversion. If you're here this morning and you're saved, say amen. amen. You know how you got saved? You did not get saved by simply having some supernatural experience where you thought that there was a 50-foot Jesus and he was telling you that you got to build a hospital and if you don't build a hospital, he'll kill you. That's not how you got saved. You didn't get saved, you know, because uh, some, some, some thing that some guy said on TV and, and I've asked people before, are you saved? And they go, man, one time I was in a car and I was driving this car and I was going 70 miles an hour and I went off into a ditch. And God saved me. And I'm like, wait, listen, I'm glad that God protected you, but that's not exactly what I mean. That's right. What I mean is, have you passed from death to life? Have you been born again? Have your sins been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? And are you a new creature in Christ? That's right. And sometimes when you ask it that way, it's like deer looking in the headlights. They're like, uh, oh, yeah, that too. Right. 
<laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> you know how you got saved? Did you say this morning? You know how you were converted? You heard the Bible. No, no, preacher, I heard the gospel. Yeah, and you know where the gospel came from? It came from that book. Uh, look in your Bibles, if you would, at 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Paul says it like this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Listen, the only way for you to have faith and to be converted and to go from darkness to light, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son, to go from death to life, to go from dead to being born again, a dead spirit to a living spirit, is by hearing the gospel, and it comes from that book. When people say, guys, uh, listen, all we need to focus on is the gospel, not so much every word of God. Guys, that is a false statement. Because when you mess with that book, you are messing with the words in it, and thus the messages that come out of it. If you believe the gospel, you need to understand it came from that book, and you are saved today because you heard the word of God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 23. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God. You can't corrupt it. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. Listen, there's a room full of people here. And I would dare say most of them have experienced a conversion that took them from death to life. You, that, this is a room full of people. For the most part, I believe there are born again believers. And the reason you can say that with confidence is because you believe the gospel that was preached to you as found in 1 Corinthians 15. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, did it not change your life? Think about two of the main figures in early church history. Two guys that write books of the Bible. One of them writes half of your New Testament, Paul. And I think about Paul sitting, as, as the Bible describes him, sitting as a child under the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of the Old Testament law. And as Paul is hearing about Moses and about the parting of the Red Sea and the Passover lamb, and Paul's hearing about the sacrifices of the, of the Old Testament priests and how it had to be a sinless sacrifice. It could have no blemish. It could have no spot. And he learns about that. And he learns about uh, Joshua going into the promised land. And he sees that there's a, a, a military leader who was a great military leader, who was a picture of another great military leader that was to come. As he's going through all the things that he learned, I wonder as he's a little boy, what's going through his mind? If he's like most six and seven year olds, he's thinking Bible and Transformers all at the same time. <laughs> and he's in and out, just like some of you are right now, in and out, right? There's Bible, then it's like, oh, the bill. I forgot about paying that bill. Oh, man. Man, that's good. I got saved. I got saved by hearing the gospel. And boy, what time are we going to have lunch? <laughs> yeah. Right? And Paul's sitting there and he's learning all this stuff. And he's, he's really not Paul yet, he's just Saul. And he's learning about the tradition of the Pharisees. And, and as he continues to grow older, what's happening is he's getting Bible, but he's realizing that the tradition of the Pharisees supersedes the, the authority of the Word of God. But you can't discount the fact that he had the Bible put in him as a young man. You know what you find in Acts chapter number 7? You find a man named Stephen. A man that loved God enough to die for him. And Stephen is standing there in Acts chapter number 7, and all he's done, all he's done wrong is profess to know Jesus Christ and profess to preach Him. And all the, the Pharisees of that day, you know what they say? They say, you need to stop preaching His name. You need to stop preaching Him publicly. And Stephen wouldn't back down. I wish we had Christians like that today. Yeah. Stephen is there, and he sees them pick up stones. Stephen, are you sure? You want to keep preaching in the name of Jesus? And there's a man standing off in the corner, probably leaning against a tree, just sort of watching what's going on over there. And every time one of those Pharisees throws a rock, one of those Jews throws a rock up in their hand, they're looking back at that young man like, we're going to get this guy, Stephen. We're going to get him for you. And that man leaning over there against the tree in the backdrop is none other than the man that you know as Paul. But he's not Paul yet, he's just Saul. He had all that doctrine and all that truth from the Old Testament put in his life. And here he is condoning and authorizing the execution of a Bible-believing Christian. And they stone Stephen and he cries out and he says, Lord, lay not this into their charge. 
He takes his last breath and he passes from this life and the next. And they take the clothes from that young man and they put him at the feet of this man named Saul. And Saul just nods his head and says, good job, boys. Saul picks up those clothes almost like a piece of trophy with the blood still drenched on it. Throws it on his back and he goes off into his life. And in Acts chapter number 8, the Bible says that Saul made havoc of the church. And everywhere he went, he went about grabbing men, women, and children and throwing them into jail and committing some of them to execution. What for? For standing up for the name of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you a question. How do you take a guy like that? And take that guy, and in one week he's killing them. In the next week, he's running with them. And he's being chased for believing the same thing that he once persecuted. How do you explain that? There's something real to that. You say, what happened to Paul? What happened to Saul? One day he's going down the road, and the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself to him. And you know what Paul hears? He hears the Lord speaking to him. And no, there was no other preacher because at that time God needed to deal directly with this man named Saul so he would become the Apostle Paul. But what you have is a great picture of a man being dealt with by God directly and God giving that man his words so that man's life could be changed and changed forever. You see what happened with Saul? He was converted. He was converted never the same. How do you take the guy that was killing people and in just a, a matter of a few weeks, that man himself is being let down in a basket over the wall of Damascus, and he's now running from the same people that he used to authorize to kill the Christians. Something drastically changed in his life. You say, was it? The Word of God was revealed to him, yeah. and it converted him. How about Peter, guys? The Bible says that Paul was the, the apostle to the uncircumcision. That's what he says in Galatians. And Peter, the apostle to the circumcision, to the Jews. And how is it you take Peter, who's just a, a rough, crude uh, fisherman. I mean, he's the guy that, without even thinking about it, cuts the guy's ear off. And in Acts, in the book of Acts, when there's a guy that's begging for silver. I mean, guys, if it was the old Peter, when that guy was begging for money, you know what Peter would have said? Hey, shut up. That's not what we're here for. You know what he said? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Yeah. It's a different guy. You know what Jesus tells Peter over there in the Gospels? When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. You say, what happens in Peter's life? Well, Peter denies the Lord. We know all about that. And one day he sits down by a fire and Jesus Christ looks directly in his eyes and he asks Peter uh, some questions. He says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You say, what was it? It was Peter being confronted with the words of Jesus. And those words provoked him to realize he was not the man that he thought that he was. And he's converted and he changes history. Can I, can I say it like this? You cannot have a conversion experience aside from the words in this book being preached to you. Are you saved this morning? Some of you are. Some of you aren't so sure. Well, if you're saved, can I say this? You ought to be excited about the fact that your salvation came from the words that were found in this book. You say, what it will give you? It'll give you conversion. I'm reading this book with my kids called The Cross and the Switchblade. Great book. Amazing book. And I'm reading about this guy, Dave Wilkerson. He's just a country bumpkin from Pennsylvania. He's not some great eloquent preacher. He's not a city guy. He didn't have this mind. He didn't grow up in the ghetto. He didn't know anything about city life. And one day he's reading a paper about these seven boys that are convicted of murder and they're all teenagers. And he feels a burden to go to, to New York City to try to meet these boys. And he eventually meets one of them. But what God shows him through that entire experience is that it wasn't about those seven. It was about the hundreds of thousands just like them. And boy, he prays and he toils and God supernaturally opens doors. And he has to raise money to try to bring in all these inner city kids. You got the, the dragons and you got the bishops and you got the chaplains and you got the mamaos, the, the Puerto Rican gangs. Got to represent the Puerto Rican gangs, right? 
And you've got, you've got all these gangs, and he tries to, to bring them all in, and he's, he's looking out from the auditorium. He's looking out into the bus, and the bus driver goes, eh, slams into the side of, of the sidewalk. And he said, he said, what's he doing? He couldn't get there fast enough to get those kids off that bus. Those kids were a mess. The girls were half-dressed, and they'd already had all kinds of relationships with boys by the age of 13 and 14. The boys at 13 and 14, some of them had already stabbed up to 16 people. These aren't good kids. <laughs> They're kids raising kids. As a matter of fact, that preacher, he's going, maybe I made a huge mistake. And he had a whole entire section of the auditorium saved for a guy uh, there that he'd been praying for named Israel. He'd been praying for Israel, as you Spanish speakers would know, Israel, right? And Israel had no idea his name even came from the Bible. Israel shows up. He's the leader of the Mamaws of that gang. And they had a double M stitched onto their leather jackets. Like you might imagine, hair slicked back. Cigarettes rolled up in here. And they walk in, and they've they got weapons, they've got knives, they've got this, they've got that. You've got rival gangs all in one auditorium. And people are coming to this preacher before the service are going, Preacher, are you sure about this? There have been times when people come to me and ask me, Are you sure about this? And I'm like, I'm very sure. And inside I'm going, I don't know. <laughs> you gotta lie, you know. <laughs> Act like you <laughs> fake it till you make it, you know. And, they come to the preacher and they go, uh, Preacher, you had this entire section saved, but these, these, these bad kids from that one gang, the worst gang of all, they're just confiscating that area. He goes, no, 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 I told them that was for them. And the usher goes, okay. The preacher walks away and he's praying. And he gets up and he, he has this girl named Maria go out on the stage and she's singing a song of the glory of God, you know, then sings my soul, my savior, God of the year, something like that. And the boys are calling out, hey, baby, when are you going to come see me? I mean, it's a mess. It's like a zoo. And he's going, what do I do? He looks out at her. He goes, hey, just come out, come out. I'll, I'll go up and preach. He feels bad for her. He gets up. He goes, God, you got to do something. God, you got to do something. And I can tell you this. I understand exactly. I read this story last night with my kids. I'm going, man, I get that guy. There have been times where I preach messages, I'm thinking, this ain't going anywhere. <laughs> Lord, can I just back out? Is there a way to, you know how we backed out of the song, we just skipped like four <laughs> verses? Lord, can I just skip forward my points and just get it over with? You know, I heard a preacher say this at camp, sometimes it feels like you're swimming through peanut butter just to get through a message. That's and, and, and his message was only 15 minutes long. Some of you are going, preacher, you should learn from that guy. <laughs> 15 minutes. That was the wrong time to say amen. <laughs> if Arlene was here, she would have double amen that. <laughs> he preached for 15 minutes. And he got to the end, he said something about loving your enemies. And one kid gets up and rips open his shirt. He goes, hey, see that? That was from some Dago. Or that's a derogatory term for an Italian. Some Dagos did this and that. And they're yelling at each other. Now look, I've had some rough messages. Never been that bad. Amen. One guy gets up and he goes, I got a bullet wound right here from one of those blankety blank people on that side of town. Preacher, this ain't real. How can we love our enemies? And he said, it would have to be a supernatural act of God. It would have to be the Holy Spirit being inside of you because you're born again. And he's looking around the room. He goes, Lord, I had no idea what else to say. So he just bows his head. Now, unless you're in front of a group of 100 or so people, three minutes goes by like that. But when you've got a butt, you several hundred eyes looking at you, some of which you're not so sure what they're going to do, three minutes feels like an eternity. That's right. And he didn't pray out loud. He just bowed his head and he just started praying. Three minutes straight. All of a sudden, he looks up and he sees Israel, the leader of that gang, and he's standing up. He's taking a handkerchief out of his pocket and he's wiping the tears away. And then he sees this kid, Nikki. And Nikki was the kid that cursed the preacher every time he came by. Nikki was the kid that before he got up to preach, he'd said, okay, I'm going to have, instead of the ushers taking up the collection, I'm going to have you gang, gang members take up the collection. And right away, he says, do I have any volunteers? Nikki jumps up, and everybody knows what Nikki's thinking. He's going to steal the money. <laughs> he jumps up, and he's got a smile on his face like, I got this one. And five of his buddies from the Mamaos get up, and they take up the collection. And Nikki stood there, 
Nikki was, was the guy that was saying, hey, more, more. <laughs> Brother Craig, we got to try that sometime, man. <laughs> hey, and until Nikki thought there was enough money, he wouldn't move on. And they get all this money collected, and they're all doing it in these cut-off milk cartons, you know, and, and they come to the back, and everybody's, all the, all the kids are laughing. They're thinking they're gone. And the preacher just bows his head. This is before he preaches, and he prays. Two minutes go by, and all of a sudden, Nicky Cruz comes in, face like this. He doesn't, it's almost like he didn't even know why he's not stealing the money. <laughs> but they all brought the money there, and the place went silent. And as he begins to preach about God's love, he realizes these kids have no idea. They've never been shown love their entire lives. As he prays at the end of his message, he looks up and he sees him wiping his eyes. And he sees Nicky Cruz getting one of them handkerchiefs out of his pocket. He's doing this number. And some guy, you know, meaning well, puts his arm around Nicky. Nicky. <laughs> rough, man, rough. Wiping his eyes. The preacher had some people from local churches there waiting for the kids in the basement. Those kids are coming down. Spiritual warfare goes on when the gospel is preached, by the way. As those boys are walking down there, rival gang members walking together to go get dealt with about their souls. As they're walking down, there's some young ladies there that are doing all kinds of things to go, hey boys, if you walk in there and accept their Jesus, you won't get any of this. Many of them look at them and still continue on. Six of those mamaos get saved that night. For those of you that know no Spanish or don't know Puerto Rican Spanish, my mouth is like a way of saying, hey, you idiot. My <laughs> when we would misbehave, my dad, <laughs> my dad would go, my mouth, venga acá, come here. <laughs> uh, Here's these kids getting told how to be saved. And Nikki Cruz says, they got, they got the little Bible, the pocket-sized Bible, you know, you can fit in your pocket. And they got the big old King James Bible. And, 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 and he's, after they get led to Christ, he goes, we want you guys to have Bibles. And they go, can we pick which one we want? He goes, yeah, we want the big one. We want everyone to know what it is. Those kids march out of there smoking with their Bible. <laughs> You say, well, they're just a rough crowd. Right. Next morning, Nick, the preacher, David Wilkerson, gets a call from the police. Uh, are you David Wilkerson? Yes, sir. Uh, do you know Israel and uh, the young men from the Mamaus? He goes, yes, sir. He says, I need you to come down here. Yes, sir. He goes to the precinct there. He walks in, and he sees the six boys sort of sitting there with their heads down, but they're sort of smiling out the corner of their eyes, looking up like this. And he's saying to himself, what in the world? And that chief of police came out and said, are you David Wilkerson? He says, yes, sir. He grabbed his hand and he shook him. He said, we've been trying for years to do something about these boys, and whatever you gave them did the job. Amen. You know what those boys had done after they got saved? They, all night long, they're reading through their Bibles in the Old Testament. And they're reading about, you know, what they think is a gang fight. It's the nation of Israel going to the promised land, you know. And they're like, man, this is cool, you know. And Israel goes, I didn't know my name was all through this book, preacher. <laughs> and they had been reading all night long and they realized, man, we were not doing things right. And they walked over to the police station that morning and they said, would you sign our Bibles? We want to pray for you. And that policeman said, whatever you did, it changed them. He said, what did the preacher give him? He gave him the book. Right. Can I say this, Christian? After you're saved, God's not done with you. Right. Yes, there, there's a conversion that God will give you from that book. But can I say this as well? God wants to change your character. After you get saved, not everything goes away. Am I right about that? I mean, some things are more visible than others, right? I mean, there's the mamals, you know, and, hey, preacher, thanks for the Bible. I mean, I mean, you know, some of you go, well, I don't think they're really saved. Oh, cut it out. Right. That's silly stuff. Right. That's not, guys, that's silly. Listen, I'll tell you this right now. More people have been hurt by a tongue that couldn't get under control than by a cigarette. 
What am I getting at, though? There's some things that God wants to change about you. Yeah. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the sun and the stars. Something, 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 and Jupiter and Mars. But he's still working on me. Aren't you glad he's still working on you? You know what God wants to do? He wants to change, listen, your thoughts. Your own ambitions, your way of thinking, your shortcomings, your habits. God wants to change that. You know how it's going to happen? It's going to happen through the Word of God. Look in your Old Testament. Go with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. Now, depending on how you look at this, I've got some good news and bad news for you. All right. The good news is we only have two points. The bad news is we only have two points. <laughs> Point number two is God wants to change your character through this book. He wants to give you a conversion through this book. You say, if you have a relationship with this book, you know what he'll do? He'll change your character. Can I, can I say this? Salvation does not automatically fix character. If you were lazy your entire life and no one instructed you on how to work... So, you know, it's not like all of a sudden, okay, now I accept Christ as my Savior, and I'm the most industrious person in the world. There might be a desire for that, but the character still has to be formed. I, I've met some people that got saved, and man, the very next day, uh, Brother Naylor said this. He said, man, I asked God to take away my language, and my language changed completely. Can I say this? I've known guys. This is a true story. I knew a guy that got saved, and when he got saved, he got down and prayed and said, Lord, you know what a blankety-blank sinner I am? And God, if you have any blankety blank idea of the kind of blankety blank man that I've been my entire blankety blank life, I mean, goes along and he gets up and he says, Jesus, will you save me? That's the only thing that God cared to hear about. You say, was he saved? Yes. But some things go a little easier than others. Am I right about that? You may conquer some of the outside stuff, but you deal with pride and envy and jealousy and so on and so forth. And God wants to change your character by revealing himself through his words. Look at Exodus chapter number 3 with me, if you would. I like this story. I like it a lot. I can relate to Moses. Exodus chapter 3, look at verse 1. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Sounds like, you know, somewhere down south or something, you know. Jethro, you know, or something like that. His father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, I'll just say this. If you live on the back side of the desert and your only friend are sheep, if something like that happens, you're probably liable to stand aside and go, whatever that is, it's more interesting than walking around with sheep. You know, God had a plan for Moses the entire time. That isolation and that solitude was part of getting his attention. And over here in verse number 3, Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And God calls on him out of that bush. We understand the rest of the story. And we understand that God says, hey, Moses, I've got a plan for you. Uh, I want you to go back to Egypt. And in chapter 4, uh, Moses sort of argues with God, and, and he, he uses what we oftentimes, almost like a false humility. Like, God, you know, I really appreciate you dealing with me about this, and I would help in nursery if I had a certificate on how to deal with children. <laughs> but, Lord, you know that I'd fall so short with my education with children, and I, I just can't take the honor of wiping their bottoms, Lord. Not today. That false, Lord, I, I would clean, I would help clean the toilets at church, but Lord, you know me, I'm not the cleanest guy. Lord, I would do this, I'm just, I'm just not good enough. And that's what Moses is doing in chapter 4. In chapter 4 of Exodus, Moses, look at verse number 11. God is dealing with Moses, and Moses is talking to God. And the Lord said unto him in verse 11, Who hath made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, Go. And I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And, and then Moses goes, well, Lord, I'm, I'm slow of speech. And, and I put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. And, Lord, I, I, I never went to seminary. And, God, I, I would do this, but I'm not that qualified. And God says, you know what? I'm tired. Just shut up. I'll give you Aaron, your brother. Will you shut up and go if I give you Aaron? Oh, yeah, that sounds a good idea. You know what's funny about that thing? In chapter 5, when they go to Pharaoh, it's Moses and Aaron. 
And, and when, when the water is turned to blood, it's Aaron that, that basically waves his hand and puts his hand over here and takes the rod of God and turns the, the waters to blood. It wasn't Moses. You read it, it's Aaron. And it's Aaron that's the mouthpiece for Moses up until chapter 8. When Pharaoh gets a little testy and Moses can't shut up anymore. And you know what happens for the rest of the book of Exodus? It's Moses talking. How does a guy go from being the guy that goes, I can't, I can't speak, I can't, especially not in front of the king of the world, Lord, I, I can't do this, and you've got to give me somebody else, and, 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 and Aaron goes with, how is it that he goes from that to being face-to-face, toe-to-toe with the mightiest king of all the world, and saying, let my people go? You see what happened? The word of the Lord was revealed to him. Yeah. Christian, you know what God wants to do with you? He wants to change your character. You know, Joshua, we look at Joshua as a mighty man of God. Joshua comes on the heels of Moses. And you look at Joshua and go, man, what a mighty man of God. He never loses one battle with the exception of Ai. And it wasn't his fault. Everywhere else that Joshua goes, he wins. By the way, as a young man, I loved reading Joshua. I mean, when I was a teenage boy, you know, the love your enemy stuff didn't appeal to me as much as cut their heads off. You know, and I'm reading through Joshua. Oh, this guy's great. Joshua is awesome. And you look at Joshua and go, man, I want to be just like him. What a great man. Can I say this? Joshua lacked courage. He said, how do you know? You know what God tells him over and over and over in the beginning of Joshua chapter number one? Only be thou very courageous. Uh, hey, Joshua, be strong and be of a good courage. Can I ask you a question? Does God ever tell you to do something that you already naturally do? No. no. Give you a great example. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You know why he tells you that? Because naturally you don't do that. That's right. Joshua, be strong and of good courage. You got it, Lord. Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Yep. Joshua, only be thou very courageous. I get it. Lord, why are you telling me this? Because I see you're shivering in your boots. And you're scared. Guys, in Exodus 32, when Moses is on the top of the mountain and God is revealing the Ten Commandments to Moses, you know who he's got? You know who Moses has with him? A young man named Joshua. And Joshua is described as the servant of Moses. And you know what happens when, when they start walking down the hill and they start hearing, you know, uh, all kinds of, of clatter and noise and, and they're hearing, na 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 Na, 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 na. And Joshua goes, there's a fight, there's a fight. We gotta, we gotta go to, Moses, we got to go, we got to go fight. And Moses goes, uh, listen a little bit closer. And Joshua's like, uh-huh. Moses is like, do you hear that? And Joshua's like, sounds like war, man. You see, Joshua was always a little bit jumpy, a little scared, a little intimidated by the things that were going on around him. You might see a man that's ready to go and fight, but really there's a man that's afraid. How do you know? Go to Exodus 33. Let me show you something that I thought was fascinating. I never saw this before. It's one of those moments where I'm like, oh, that wasn't there before. <laughs> Exodus 33. Exodus chapter 33. Look, if you would, here in verse number 7, Moses took the tabernacle. You say, when is this? This is after everyone has stripped themselves naked and after they made the golden calf and after they had the worship service to the golden cow. And, you know, they, they're, they're, they're just basically making a mess of the testimony of their God and, and they've gone the way of the heathen. After all of that, Moses says, you know what? I don't know what to do with you people. But I know this much. I need to get with God. You guys stay here. I'm going without the camp. I'm going a little bit further from where you guys are. I'm pitching a tent up. And you say, what was it? It was his mobile church. Yeah. That was his church app. Amen. He <laughs> grabbed the tent, went with him, and they threw it up. And he walks in and starts talking with God. If you're not careful, you'll, you'll ignore the fact that there was a young man that went in with Moses into the tabernacle. The young man was Joshua. And Moses... Talks with God like a man talks to his friend face to face. Great stuff there. But I want you to notice in verse 11, I want you to see something. The Lord speaking to Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. You know what that means? He got done talking with God, 
He goes back to where all the people of Israel are. But someone stays at church a little longer. I want you to notice here in verse 11, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. It's almost like a P.S. Like if you're not paying attention, it's like, well, what does that matter? You know what Joshua saw? Moses was talking to God, and God was giving Moses his words. And Moses walks by Joshua, and he's probably like, hey, come on, boy, let's go. And Joshua has his head down. He just says, Moses goes on back to the camp, and Joshua goes, Lord, whatever it is that Moses has with you, I want some of that. God, would you reveal your word to me? God, would you speak to me? I understand he's in the position that he's in for a reason, and you've called him to that position, but God, can I just get a glimpse of that? Lord, would you? I think what happened there is Joshua was getting something from God. God was revealing some of his words to Joshua. And that was the foundation of what eventually becomes the ministry of Joshua after Moses passes on. I don't know. I can't prove this from the Bible, but I wonder if God would have chosen somebody else if he hadn't seen a young man say, you know what, I'll let the preacher go. I'll let everybody else take care of what they're taking care of. But God, I need something from you. And he eventually goes from being a timid and an afraid man to being one of the greatest military leaders that this world ever saw. Courage. I would define true courage to be a perfect sensibility, the measure of danger, and a mental willingness to endure it. Guys, we could talk about oh, some great men of God. You could talk about Samuel and how Samuel was there in the temple, and he was raised in the temple by a man named Eli, and Eli loved him like his own son. As a matter of fact, Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas, they were so backslidden and so away from God, I believe that Eli saw a chance to make a difference in Samuel's life where he couldn't even make a difference in his own son's lives. And Samuel was raised in the temple by Eli, and eventually there was going to come a day when Samuel would have to tell Eli, God is done with you because you have elevated your sons and your family above God. But Samuel's just a little boy. Samuel was going to need something in his life to give him the character he would need to stand up for God. There was going to come a day when Samuel would look face to face with the king of Israel, a man named Saul, a man who at the, at the feeling and the sense of anger and, and wrath and displeasure with somebody else because of envy, he would take a javelin and throw it at David like that and not think twice about it. Saul was a man that would grab a javelin and throw it at his own son and didn't think twice about it. And there would come a day when Samuel would have to look into Saul's eyes and say, God is done with you, and the kingdom has departed from your house. Do you know what had to happen first in chapter number 3 of 1 Samuel? The word of the Lord would have to be revealed to that young man to give him the character that he would someday need to stand and do what God asked him to do. Look, if you would, at Luke chapter number 2, we could talk about all kinds of great men of God. But I want to talk about the greatest man that ever lived. We could talk about Moses. We could talk about Joshua. We could talk about Samuel. We could talk about the prophets. But can I brag on my Savior for just a moment? And let me say this. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. I believe that. I believe he was the Son of God. If he's just a man like everybody else, he cannot die on my behalf and pay for my sins. No differently than if this book is like any other book. It has no supernatural power to change your life. But I believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. But can I ask you something? Just, just think about this for a moment. God manifest in the flesh was once in diapers. I'm not being blasphemous. I'm trying to get you to think. There was a time when, when little, little toddler Jesus would run around the house and maybe he'd pick up a knife and Mary would go, no, 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 we don't run with sharp objects. I mean, that's not a sin. You understand when a kid just grabs something and they don't know any different yet, that it's not a sin? And there was a time when, when you know, Mary would be cooking something and, and Jesus would get real close and he'd tug on her, mama, 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 and he'd put his hand toward the stove. And she'd go, no, 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 don't touch that. And he'd look at Mary, look at the stove. You say, why? Because he was a baby and a toddler just like everybody else. That's right. 
And we know him as the Savior of the world and as a coming king. That's right. But there was a time when some character had to be put in his life. And can I subscribe to you that part of what had to be put in his life for him to understand who he was and why he was here came from the Bible? Yeah. Let me prove it to you. Look at Luke chapter number, 12, Luke chapter number 2. Even our Savior, he did not need to be converted, amen? He was sinless. But there were some things that had to be revealed to him because he had con constricted himself to a human body. Yes, he was God, 100% God, but he was 100% man. And he lived the human experience like we do. That blows my lid every time I think about it. That's just wild stuff. I don't understand it, but I believe it. <laughs> And I want to point out to you something. Look, if you would, at Luke chapter 2. And look, if you would, at verse 42. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. I remember when I was a kid one time. I'm going to give you another interesting story for those that don't know. My dad and my... Mom took us to church one time, and one time in particular, my grandma from Puerto Rico was visiting. And I didn't go to Catholic church often. That was the, the faith, quote-unquote, that I, you would say maybe I was raised with-ish. But we went when grandma was in town. You guys with me? When the matriarch visits, we go to church. And so, man, we went to church there one time. I didn't know where I was at. I had no idea. I'd never been there before. You know, and Grandma's like, oh, do you like church? I'm going, uh-huh. Never been here before, but yes, yes, we do. You know, and, and, and so we're, we go to church, have service. Church is over. It's Easter Sunday. I remember palm leaves and stuff like that. And, and you know what happens? My family leaves me at church. <laughs> Suffering just like Jesus. And I'll never forget, you know, somehow they got through to my parents and my dad came in and go, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. My mother, I'm so sorry, you know, we didn't mean to we're so sorry. And I'm just eating candy. <laughs> they kept me pacified with food, man, and it worked just fine. But I can relate to Jesus. I was left at church one time. His parents left my church, but you know what he did? He didn't just sit there and eat candy. Right. He, he was nothing like me. He sees the doctors and the lawyers of the law. And they've got a book. Pulling out these scrolls. And I believe something happened on that day that was different than any other day in Jesus' life. Why do you suppose nothing is mentioned from birth to 12 years old? And nothing is mentioned after 12 years of age until he's a 30-year-old man. Something happened that day. You say, what happened? I believe he realized who he was. You say, how can you prove it? Look down, if you would, when they come back and they're crying because they left him in the temple and Mary's all upset. Look at verse number 49. Look at how he responds. He said to them, how is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my... All of a sudden, Joseph goes, he knows. He gets it. Something, somebody told him something that we haven't even said yet. He realizes who he is. That day marked a different day in Jesus' life, and he would never be the same. What do you suppose the book was that they opened when he realized who he was? You think maybe he's reading there in Micah and how it prophesies of a Savior that would come and be born in Bethlehem of Ephratah? Do you suppose maybe it's Isaiah chapter number 50 where he's reading about a suffering servant there that dies in, in agony over the sins of the people? Do you think maybe it's, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting for the Lord God will help me. Do you think maybe at that moment in time he started crying realizing this is about me? He wouldn't have known without opening this. Aren't you glad his parents left him in the temple? He goes on to die for your sins, and your sins, and your sins, and your sins, and my sins. And I believe something started at the age of 12 that he finished at the age of 33 when he said, It is finished. God gave him the character he needed by revealing things from this book. 
Christian, if you're going to finish what God has started in you with your salvation, it's going to come through getting into this book. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here, let me say,